Hey, everyone. It's so great to be a part of SOSV's 2023 Climate Tech Summit. I'm Larissa Zimbaroff. I'm a journalist and an author. I wrote a book on this industry, food tech. It's called Technically Food, Inside Silicon Valley's Mission to Change What We Eat. Pick up a copy today. Um, but I'm so excited to be here and moderating this panel around the future of meat. And I don't often get to talk to both sides of the agricultural landscape at the same time. And today I get both like the leader in cultured meat uh, from Upside, I have the Vanguard from Prolific Machines, and I have someone that worked at the USDA all in one uh, virtual room, which is so cool. Um, so anyways, uh, we're going to talk about the nitty gritty about what they're doing. And if you're a founder listening to this, stay to the end because you are going to get some great advice, I imagine, from these leaders. So um, we're going to introdu introduce this panel real quick. Everyone's going to tell me what they're doing right now. Um, Eric, you should start because you're you're sort of the, the, the hero right now in Cultivated Meat. Uh, well, thank, thanks, Larissa. Eric Schulze at Upside Foods. Uh, I run our regulatory and government affairs shop, uh, and we were the first uh, cultivated meat company in 2015, then Memphis Meat, now Upside Foods. And uh, it's been a wild ride so far. I can't complain. You know, a uh, little known fact is that uh, Memphis Meats had an Indiegogo campaign, um, which I think maybe you're the only cultivated meat company to do that. We did. We did yeah. do we did do an Indiegogo <laughs> campaign. I'm so curious what the, the gifts were. You got to you got to raise money however you can uh, in these funding environments. <laughs> um, so I'm going to kick it to Phil because I'm so excited. Phil, you were with USDA and now you're with a new company. Um, tell tell me what you're working on. Certainly. So uh, just as a, a, a couple of sentences of background, I'm actually a microbiologist, uh, uh, undergraduate and PhD. I worked in research for many years, joined the USDA for about 19 years in the Agricultural Research Service and in the Food Safety Inspection Service. And right now I'm serving as a senior vice president for global food safety and quality assurance for OSI group, which uh, makes a wide variety of products for our customers. But we specialize in meat and plant protein Thanks, Phil. Um, so it's a co-manufacturer, right? Do I have that right? Correct. Wonderful. So um, someone like Upside could actually hire you, you know, to make their their newfangled meat, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, cool. And um, last but not least, Dennis Kent, who is uh, the first cultivated meat company to be doing something I have not thought of yet. Uh, Dennis, tell us a little bit about you and Prolific Machines. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Dennis. I'm a recovering stem cell biologist and currently the co-founder and CEO of a company called Prolific Machines. Uh, we invent new ways to grow and control cells. So everything from uh, rethinking how the cells are designed and doing some cutting edge synthetic biology to rethinking how we make bioreactors and software to control those bioreactors. Uh, the problem that we're trying to solve is that traditionally the way that people grow mammalian cells is Suboptimal, to be polite, it's very expensive, quite tedious, not very reproducible. The cells get contaminated all the time. And so we're trying to create a new process that can really uh, compete with factory farming uh, economically and also be used in other 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 areas. Great. Awesome. It's so, so great to be here with you guys. Um, I'm going to do, I like to do a quick fire question just to like uh, grease the wheels, get us all thinking about the same thing. So I, in my book, I cover precision fermentation, algae, mycelium, cultivated meat. There's so many areas in food tech, uh, people that are trying to solve for the future of food, for the increased population, for climate issues, drought, fire, famine, uh, pandemic, you name it, we have had it. Um, so what do you think is going to be um, accepted by the consumer, uh, by consumers first? Which of these sort of out there ideas for the future of food um, will, will people embrace and go mainstream first and quickly? Why? Phil, I'm going to start with you. All right. Well, I think that that's a, a that's a, a great question. And I think that, uh, you know, it, it really is people are creatures of habit. So I think um, it, it personally, I think that if you can mimic something that people are used to, that's the that's the uh, alternative that they're going to choose first. It may not be the the ultimate alternative. OK, great. And what, well, what do you think is closest on mimicking what we what we know and love? 
Uh, well, that's still actually to be seen. I think there's been great stride forwards in traditional meat uh, processing to make it a lot more carbon neutral and, and really environmentally sound. Uh, but then there's also some wonderful um, uh, plant-based uh, proteins, which are making great strides. So w which do you like better if, the, if, we're, if we're, I'm naming unnamed burger company one and two? Yeah, I, I'm just kind of, I'm going to stay neutral here. I'm an omnivore. Okay. I eat everything. <laughs> okay. Dennis, what do you think is going to land first with the mainstream? I mean, precision fermentation products are already on the market and people are enjoying them. I think the, the reason why that's happened is because they've been able to get to a price point that people can afford. And that hasn't yet happened with cultured meat. And you can see that manifesting in uh, the launches that have happened recently where, you know, it's a uh, two days out of thirty, or just Mondays and Mondays and Tuesdays, and so uh, I think it's going to require uh, really significant innovations to bring the cost down because consumers are very price inelastic when it comes to meat. Inelastic, I like that word, uh, Eric. Let's pretend everything's at market. What do you think consumers are going to embrace, and what what can go mainstream first? I honestly, I'm a pragmatic optimist. I actually don't disagree with Dennis on this. I think it's if it what costs right and is available. Consumers do not want to have to think. They want what they know and what's familiar. So I completely agree. It just they just have to have it. It has to cost the right thing. It has to be safe. I think that's the winner right there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I like that. Well, and we'll 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 maybe try to push on that cost thing because I'm not sure that we have it yet for cultivated meat. Because as Dennis said, you know, eat. Uh, eat just good meat there in uh, DC, and it's in very limited amounts. And Eric, you are at Dominique Crenn's Bar Crenn, but it's uh, one weekend a month. It's very limited, and so I'll kick it to you as as my first, you know, official question. Now that you have FDA and USDA approval, and you've mentioned that your next job is to figure out how to bring it truly to market, um, what is standing in your way? What is keeping you busy or, or keeping you up at night and in, in how to go from one weekend a month for eight people at Bar Crenn to, you know, 20 Safeways to 100 Kroger's, you know, et cetera? This isn't magic. It's scale up. <laughs> That's the, it's the name of the game. Like this is in not, we're not invent reinventing the wheeler. Dennis, Phil, all of us have the same issues. It's, can you scale? Um, and for, for me particularly, I'm continue, continuing to run the regulatory shop. So the next set of approvals for the next generation products that are, um, obviously those, the types of products that we could take to retail. So for us, it's getting to retail and building our commercial scale facilities, um, that actually can produce products at a price point that most people can afford. There's more to talk about, but I'm going to flip it to Dennis because Prolific is doing something totally different. Um, and I know you can't talk about everything you're doing, but you're going to try to speak to like, tell us about how you think what you're doing is going to get us to cultivated meat that can scale and get to the mainstream. So there's a, there's a number of things that we're doing, but probably the most important is figuring out ways to eliminate the most expensive inputs and simultaneously increase yields. And a couple of years ago, that was just speculation, but now we've empirically proven that we can do this. We can eliminate the most expensive inputs and we can simultaneously increase yields. And what that means is that we can get to price points for beef in our first few commercial scale facilities of sub $7 per kilogram and doing that credibly, which is not something that I think other companies can do, but it is something that we want to make available to other companies because the reason why we started prolific is because we want to help all cultured meat companies. But let's quickly talk about what you think are the most expensive piece parts of the process and what needs to be rethought about, right? Like in as, in as unscientific and friendliest way possible. But wait, we're scientists. We let's do, let's do it. <laughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dennis. Sorry. Yeah, so, so at scale, the most expensive thing becomes the, the soup that you grow the cells in, as people refer to it as media. And within that soup, the part of that soup that is most expensive are these recombinant proteins that you have to add. And um, the biopharma industry has been using them for decades. They work very well to make expensive uh, pharmaceuticals, and they work really well to make expensive meat. 
But if you want to uh, compete with factory farming, they don't work. The cost of these proteins alone is more than the cost of wholesale factory farming. So we found a way to not need any of these proteins and simultaneously increase the yield. And basically what that does is it allows you to dramatically reduce your costs. And reducing the costs is going to be essential, not just to uh, you know, get to market at a price point that people will people will buy, but also to sustain a business long term. I think most people don't really understand that the most important thing with cultured meat is going to be how much operating profit can your company create. Because when you project into the future, like multiple decades, you realize I I, I do this uh, I do this frequently. You realize how much debt is going to be required in order to build out these facilities. We're talking about billions of dollars worth of debt that will be required, and you'll have to service that debt. And if you assume even like a very optimistic cost of capital of say six percent, which is you know what Beyond has in the annual report. You're going to need really, really high operating profits in order to service the debts that are going to be required to build out these facilities, because every facility is multiple hundreds of millions of dollars. And so it's not clear to me that existing technologies can create the operating profit that is required for this industry to scale. And so that's really the whole point of Prolific. We want to create this technology stack that can that can make that operating profit and then make it available to everybody. and yeah, there's, there's basically two ways to do it, right? You either try and increase the cost of your products, which is problematic because people are price inelastic when it comes to meat. You So you increase the price or you decrease the cost. Um, yeah, I think increasing the price is going to be difficult if you peg it to say organic. You can peg it to organic meat, but that you know helps in the sense that you use 60% more expensive, but then you're capped out at like 1.5% of the meat market. And so you don't have the multi-trillion dollar TAM anymore. So really, you're going to have to go down in the cogs. Yeah. So Dennis, the, you're, you, you sound like you're, you could, you've convinced a lot of investors of your approach. What, what is Prolific raised to date? Uh, over 50 million, but I, it's not me that does the convincing. The data, the data does the convincing. The data does convincing. So, okay. Have they, have the investors sampled what Prolific has grown yet? Um, investors have not, but I have. You have. Okay, great. Um, yeah. It's important to note that in my view with cultured meat, the, the, the important question is not, can you make it? You know, people like Eric and Upside have already proven that you can make it. And they've already proven that it tastes good. Like those are not the questions that are outstanding in my view. The question that's outstanding is, can you build a cultured meat business with the operating profit that's going to be required to raise the billions of dollars in debt that are going to be required to transform animal agriculture? That is an outstanding question. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is this is good because cultivated meat has raised um, in the billions and it's going to need more, as you said. Um, <laughs> Or Klein called it saying that we needed a moonshot and we need government support so that we can find the money to, to support this pro project. Um, I'm curious about this, the soup though, because I've been following this industry for so long and this, like the media, the growth factors, the nutrients, like how we grow the meat is, is crucial and upside. Eric, tell me, where are you with a plant-based soup and where are you with either genetically engineering cells so that you can um, give them They'll, they'll require less. Like, where are you with that scale up problem that Dennis has mentioned? Yeah, I think Dennis is completely accurate. Like from a scientific standpoint, there's, I think there's, there's no real debate there. I think that those, the sort of fundamental base reality we agree on. Um, and the, the idea that for us, you know, again, it's not, we've said this before, the, the cell culture, the feed or the media is between 80 and 85% of the per pound cost. That's again, completely. And again, growth factors, completely exorbitantly expensive, uh, generally speaking. Uh, and completely agree. Um, for us, the commercial facility, again, the whole goal is to have retail products that compete on um, with conventional products in terms of pricing. That's the goal for the convention, this commercial scale pro process. One, one way to do that, of course, is look exactly. Well, actually, there's only one way to do this. It's lower your cogs. Um, it's increase your purchasing and negotiating power. The one thing that that Dennis didn't touch on, but I think is probably I think we'd agree with, and Phil would definitely agree with, is the role of public policy and also this creating this fair and level playing field. For example, right now, I do not, as a cultured cultivated meat producer, have access to public funds. 
um, that could allow me to put steel in the ground. And Dennis is right. Investors do not want to give a lot of money to put steel in the ground. It's extremely expensive. It's a debt laden exercise. And that's why I think a lot of, like, for example, uh, conventional meat has a huge advantage where they've already invested this money and have these facilities that are up and running. We have to build them. So getting access to federal loan and grant programs is super important to offloading the risk from the investors to the government and us in having skin in the game. And that's what we're doing in, a, uh, in terms of uh, building the federal and public infrastructure to get funding to put steel in the ground. And that's incredibly important. I don't know, Dennis, if you disagree with that or not, but I think it, it's biological and it's sociological, and you can't ignore those when you're scaling up, from my perspective. So we're working on both, Larissa. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Um, so we Definitely. only have two more minutes to talk, and there's, there's so much to do. You know, I want to ask Phil, um, what role do uh, large um, conventional producers, uh, conventional meat, have in the future of what what the American consumer eats? Yeah. So I think I think some of the the pieces have already been touched on by by Dennis and and, and Eric already. But uh, I I think the the uh, traditional meat companies, you know, they already have the steel in the ground. They already are making an affordable product uh, for the consumers. Um, there's going to be a role that continues to be played. There's a lot of folks out there with a lot of different priorities. Some people really want a connection to the an animal. Uh, some people are going to uh, um, will really want to to know that their that their food came from an animal that was on uh, on a on a farm at some point, uh, and the traditional meat companies can supply that. Um, but it is very clear from everybody that the consumers have spoken and they expect that the food production is sustainable. So it's become almost everybody in the industries, one of their major three focuses on, is on sustainability. In fact, here at OSI, we have a model farm that has about 200 uh, head of cow uh, in the UK, and we have line of sight to, for them being uh, zero carbon by 2030. So, so the consumer is has spoken, and and I think that the the traditional meat industry is responding there, and really is trying uh, its best to make sure that that uh, their practices are sustainable as possible. Um, why that's 2030, six and a half years away? Why is it going to take so long to get these two, only 200 cows to zero carbon? Well, I, first of all, I think that it's an amazing feat, uh, but even by 2030. Um, but but it does once again, as as everyone said, it does take capital. So there's a couple of pieces of of technology that number one need to be perfected, and number two need to be implemented out there. Mm -hmm. our, our job really is to work with you know not only academics but also on farm uh, practitioners to see something that is that is practical and implementable and and makes sense out there. And so it is a longer process, and it just it's it's a trial and error out there uh, for actually making it happen in the field. It seems like there are uh, some gaps in what, what the industry needs, like just the meat industry and tech on the technology side. So maybe from each of you, you know, what, what do you wish someone was working on that we don't have today and, or isn't like as high level as what you want? Like Dennis, what's missing that you can't get or you have to make yourself? That's, that's an excellent question. Uh, so Prolific's really focusing on the most expensive cost driver, which is the recombinant proteins, eliminating those and improving the yields. After that, uh, the second biggest cost driver is CapEx. The largest driver of that CapEx is sterility requirements. So eliminating steam is the low hanging fruit. A lot of companies are working on it. After that, you end up with amino acids being the next most expensive thing. A lot of people are working on plant hydrolysates instead of using uh, purified amino acids. I think that's an excellent idea. I think more innovations in hydrolyzing enzymes would be excellent. You look at some amino acids like glycine are already extraordinarily cheap at like $1,600 per metric ton. Um, it, it's because it can be produced thermochemically, but other amino acids can't. So more innovation on, mm -hmm. let's say, producing other amino acids thermochemically, better hydrolyzing enzymes, that would be excellent news for all cultured meat companies and i think yeah. will happen that's great uh, maybe maybe that's something i feel like new harvest could support academically i feel like maybe in in academia i know you you left it many of you left it behind but getting more work there would be pretty interesting uh eric what do you wish someone was working on to support the cultivated meat industry and from a technology standpoint a million data points on people eating cultivated meat <laughs> I, I think that's i need a proof point globally i need and the second thing i need international harmonization and regulatory policies mm -hmm. phil will tell you we both worked in the federal government 
the one of the things that's going to make this a roadblocks the U.S. cannot prevent is how other countries restrict or app, provide access to these products. So I need I need data points and do people like these products, and then we can start tuning. Dennis and 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 myself can be working on that aspect, and then also. I completely agree with Dennis, by the way, in terms of just the cogs that's in the scientific realities. That's all completely rational, but also that I just need to know, can I sell these elsewhere? So when people leave Bar Cren after their meal, do they get a very lengthy questionnaire? <laughs> not, not to my knowledge. <laughs> so, all right, well, you're um, missing out then. Uh, I think we, we do we do ask them uh, questions, but again, you know, that's nobody wants to be, have an exit poll as they come out from their 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 meal. So, Eric, Eric, you're very charming. I wouldn't mind if you came to. Like it should be you. I don't need yeah, one week in a month. It's no big deal. <laughs> I'll talk to uh, him about giving you a little more money so that you can do that one weekend. <laughs> Um, Phil, um, from a safety standpoint, what does uh, traditional meat and cultivated meat need that isn't really being addressed by by the startup community right now? Yeah, I, well, I think uh, so from a sustainability, I'll get to the safety in a second, but the sustainability, it's interestingly enough, it's the same idea here is, is a lot about sustainability is going to be feed for the animals. I mean, they're they're digesters themselves. But the question is, is what kind of inputs are best to really uh, maximize that conversion of, of feed to to uh, to product that is edible for people and desirable for people? So I think that it's, it's interesting that whether you're cultivated or you're a traditional meat provider, you're having the same question questions that we need to really uh, kind of tackle out there. From a safety point of view, I think there's, a, there's, you know, there's, a, there's a, it's kind of a paradigm shift from an organic model, which has shared microflora and, and issues um, back and forth between humans and the animals. And you've taken that out, but then there is a, um, uh, I won't even necessarily, there's a, a an unknown um, hazard with uh, cultured meat and not to say that, that there is any particular hazard, but we really just need to know uh, and continue to do our studies to make sure that there aren't hazards that are kind of hidden in the process somewhere out there. I think uh, the companies that I've worked with and I've seen their information for, and then they've convinced both FDA and USDA that they have done a really great job of hazard analysis up to this point. But it really is going to be a job of kind of making sure that the consumers understand the level of safety. And that goes also to Eric's point about the international community here. I think I think there is a drive in the international community for these sorts of products throughout uh, the developed nations out there, whether that's you know Israel, Europe, Japan, uh, Asia. Uh, I think that there is there there are people that are working for it, especially for in, in countries that are that have uh, food security issues going on. Places like Israel with no arable land, places like. Uh, um, uh, island islands which have no, no no room to grow livestock. How do you provide an affordable meat source? So I think there is a desire for these things to happen throughout the world, but I think that it's just going to really take a lot of information and a lot of just being transparent and open with the consumer about the the level of testing we've done and the safety of the products. Okay, so this is this is good because it leads into my next question, which is, you know, our food is becoming more complex. How can consumers be sure of what they're eating? And now we're talking about, you know, like other countries sending cultivated meat here. And as Eric pointed out, regulatory is different country to country. Um, sometimes I think the EU is great because they're really much stricter. Um, so I appreciate what they do than I think the U.S. is. So how... To everybody, each one, each one of you, and we'll start with Dennis because you're sort of the earliest stage company, right? Before your meat gets to the market, but how can how do we understand what we're eating? You know, it's not a QR code that that I then read a, a 300 page document. How do I figure this out? And you know, we can't just say people don't care. Uh, it's an excellent question and one that I think about a lot. Uh, I can't speak for all the cultured meat companies, but what we're going to do at Prolific is we're going to publish all of the safety and nutritional data that we have on our meat in peer-reviewed papers that are you know, independently validated by experts. I would really encourage other cultured meat companies to do the same. I think just cultured meat companies going out and saying our meat is safe is not going to be sufficient. I think it's going to have to be independently validated, and you know, that I, I'm personally very much on board with that. Uh, 
That's great. If we have That's nothing great. to hide, then we should we should make it independently validated and peer reviewed. Okay, wonderful, Eric. I mean, we we had the federal government. To me, that's the independent val. I had two agencies look at this, uh, and it's public. You can send your meat. You said to me, you you can send it to Europe. Like how are they, like like they may not know you as well as I know you, but like how mm-hmm. how do other countries like understand? You know, I do know that the U.S. has a very good reputation. Like, what if Chinese cultivated meat was coming here? Like, you know, how do we know anything? And I'm not. This isn't like a China. Thing. I understand. That's like a me not knowing regulatory agencies in other countries. I mean, that's that's a you know, that's why we have the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Department of Commerce and all these trade alliances. And and then, for example, like USDA has a whole lab that all they do is analyze meat samples that come in to verify that they are, in fact, what they say they are. Uh, mm-hmm. Even our products have to go through that. So I think, you know, to me, it's 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 interesting because the system already exists. Um, the question is, and I think it's a fair debate, whether it's a sufficient or adequate or not. Mm-hmm. And I think that's totally fair. That's a fair debate. And I think that it's sufficient and adequate. Um, and, you know, and then you can add to that by, with independent audits um, of your products. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Phil? Yeah. So I think, I think one of the, the, the uh, key pieces to USDA food safety inspection service uh, is that all labels must with claims must be approved by the agency prior to them going into market. It's a little bit different. It's kind of unique almost uh, in, in almost every other regulatory market. It's basic that they will rely on someone complaining about a claim and then going back and looking at it. But USDA has, you have to positively demonstrate that they have, there's a body of data that is, that is surrounding those claims. So I really think that clear and accurate labels are really important. Um, the consumer needs to know what they're what they're what they're taking into their body. And I think if if you uh, ever um, inadvertently or inadvertently uh, fool a, a customer into eating something they didn't think they were eating, you're never going to get that customer back once they realize it. So I think it's just really important to be open up front, like Dennis said, peer reviewed, anything anything you can do to be open and upfront about what is happening in your product and how it is safe and wholesome, I think goes a long way with the consumer. They understand and they see you being um, um, uh, sincere when you talk about your product and your open like that. I would say that also to anybody who's going into this uh, to this uh, market space and looking for regulators, regulators do the same thing. As I said before, they really think an inspector is there on behalf of the American consumer and they take that job seriously. Being clear and being honest with them goes a long way to helping um, uh, get through the regulatory process. As far as imports and exports, Eric is right. Uh, I, I think the USDA FSIS has a wonderful system that you have to have equivalent laws that would give the equivalent level of, of protection and that those laws have to be applied in the establishments that are producing those products. And once the products hit the border, they're sampled to make sure that those claims, any claims that you may have are actually true before they hit the American consumer. Um, so I think that these there is a place for regulators. There is a place for just being truthful and honest to everybody. Um, nobody should feel like they're being um, uh, you know, a hard sell when they're eating cultured meat. They should want to try the product and they'll come back if they feel uh, satisfied. Yeah, I mean, Eric's right. I mean, our regulatory system works. We have the framework. It's, it's, um, you know, we just have to hope it's like, it's all, it's all like, you know, happening so that, that when we do start seeing more cultured meat coming to market, that nothing goes wrong because that's where, that's where it'll be a problem. But okay. So we got to wrap up, which is just unfortunate because I could talk, I could ask questions for a long time. We won't see any climate shifts until we see one of three things. Industrial meat changes its methods to be less damaging to the planet. Cultivated meat becomes available and consumers accept it, or we eat less meat. So my last question, which of these will happen first? Sure. Uh, I think they're all happening right now. And I think that's going to be concurrent. I think that that they're making uh, leaps and bounds in all three of those spaces. I think people are leading, e- eating less meat. I think traditional meat uh, processes are getting more and more attuned to making sure that they're not destructive to the environment. And I think cultured uh, meat is going to have a, a, a prominent place in the future there as the cost comes down. And as this product becomes more and more available, especially in areas where 
where there's food security issues. I think that all three of them are going to play a vital role in making sure that we have a sustainable protein uh, uh, source for the future. Okay. I agree on two out of three. I think uh, uh, I don't think people are going to be eating less meat. In fact, uh, the demand curves tell the opposite story. The the demand for meat is going to be doubling between now and 2050. And people and I eat a shit ton of meat, even though I know exactly how bad it is and I feel terrible about it, but I can't stop myself. And a lot of people feel the same way. Eric loves yeah. barbecue, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna have a little barbecue session at some point. <laughs> I am completely motivated to solve this because I want to absolve myself of my own personal guilt, and I think a lot of people feel this way. I'm not gonna stop eating meat. That cognitive totally dissonance is not gonna go away, um, and until I feel like to Phil's point, we gotta do this. We have all the options. I actually think there's one more thing. I think Dennis would agree with this too. There are. Uh, you know, innovation is punctuated. You know, sometimes it, something will happen that gives us new insight into a way of doing something that we didn't think was that was going to be linear, and now it becomes exponentially easier. We don't know. That's of course the unknown unknown. We don't know how that 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 innovation will happen. I could tell you what it is, but those are the things you can't necessarily predict. That go, oh, this is now possible for real. We can really draw down on some climate change or carbon capture technology or whatever. Maybe the cow becomes carbon negative. I, you know, I. But I don't want to dismiss the the future state that we cannot predict yet. And that's why we're all here. That's why all three of us are here. Phil is demonstrable for the policy. Uh, we had to start it, try our best. Dennis is going to build on it and make it a million times better. Would a, would a carbon negative cow absolve you of your guilt? Uh, probably it would really help uh, right. it's, <laughs> it absolves me of at least one bucket of guilt you know <laughs> um, well if anyone that's watching this knows of a carbon negative barbecue that we can all meet up at let us know in the chat um, uh, when the when this goes live I'd love to know um, thanks so much for your time, Eric, Dennis. Good luck with your business, with your company, Phil, with your new adventure. Um, Eric, I look forward to seeing uh, cultivated meat from upside uh, at more locations soon. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. guys. Bye, everyone. Bye.